Collecting older video games is a pain in the ass. Seriously, while in some cases games are much cheaper years later, this goes out the window if the game still has any demand for it. This is no more apparent than with Nintendo consoles. Last video we talked about Mario Kart Double Dash and Joe made this comment. <laughs> looks like a cookie. Don't eat the game, man. Those things are like 80 bucks each on eBay. However, there is still genuine truth to what he said. If you want to play first party GameCube games, you better expect to shell out 50 or 60 dollars for them despite their age. In fact, some GameCube games like Paper Mario will go for even more than that. But those aren't the games that we want to focus on here. While those games are still worth a good amount, there are some GameCube games that are so expensive they'll go for hundreds or even thousands of dollars. So we're going to review some of them. Please don't tell me we're going to use my optical drive again after last time. Actually no, you see, we're not exactly made of money here, so while we are reviewing these older games, we don't actually own the copies. Instead, using an SD card, you can install software onto a Nintendo Wii and then play ISO files of GameCube games off a USB device and use the Wii's GameCube ports to plug a controller in. And it's basically like playing the real thing, but just completely free. Now this may or may not necessarily be legal, but spending the price of a used car for some 20 year old games that nobody outside of collectors gives a shit about is just criminal. Just don't tell Nintendo. While most game companies don't care all that much if you play or emulate games that they aren't even selling anymore, Nintendo does for some reason. Now why Nintendo is so into the idea of people playing free versions of games that they don't even want to re-release anymore for people to buy is beyond me, but I still want to play low because the last thing I need is the Nintendo to come in and... Did I hear the word emulation? think you're doing here. You're basically taking the food out of a poor Miyamoto's plate. Well, I'm just playing some uh, DK Jungle League, see? With your car. Mm-hmm. And where are your bongos? Oh, you don't actually need the bongos to play. You can still play with the standard GameCube controller. I think you of all people should know this. Oh, ho. And uh, what is with the uh, USB stick coming out of your Wii, hmm? Uh, it's in there, so I don't lose it. Alright then. I've got my eyes on you. Alright, let's get started. The first game we'll play is called Chibi Robo. This game goes for a little around $300 on eBay, on Amazon it's about $400. Even a disc only copy will set you back $150, another $60 if you want to buy an empty game case. This game was re-released on the Wii as part of the new Play Control series, but only in Japan, meaning you'll need a Japanese Wii or a modded Wii to play it. And there may not be an option to play in your preferred language. This game was released in 2005 and actually started a bit of a franchise the most recent game coming out in 2015 on the 3DS. I'm not going to review any of these games with the impression of whether or not they're worth the money because really no fucking game is worth this much, so I might as well just say whether or not I personally enjoyed the game. In Chibi Robo you play as a toy robot that a girl gets as a birthday present. The whole goal of the game is to collect happy points and do good deeds. The controls can be a little confusing at times, but it's nothing too hard to learn. One thing about this game is there's a surprisingly large amount of dialogue for a game that doesn't really have that much complex of a concept. I mean, you literally have to sit through 5 minutes of unskippable cutscenes before you even get to do anything, and then for the next 10 or so minutes you do like 2 seconds worth of gameplay before you get interrupted again and then have to read more dialogue. I understand the concept of a tutorial, but let me play the damn game already! There is, however, a lot of charm to this game. For example, when Chibi Robo walks, his footsteps make music note sounds, and the music changes depending on what type of surface you're on. I also always like 3D platformers where an ordinary house is like a whole level. It reminds me a lot of some of the Toy Story games. There is a lot of creativity here. Chibi Robo has a day and night cycle, so you only have a short amount of time to do what you have to do before it resets to the next time zone. This isn't necessarily a problem on its own, What's annoying is the fact that you have a battery to worry about. If Chibi Robo runs out of battery, you die, so you need to get to the nearest outlet and charge. 
The problem is you often have to drop what you're doing to charge which burns up time that you could be using to spend doing what you need to do in the level which is a bit frustrating, especially with how fast Chibi Robo's battery drains. While this does play like a platformer, it feels more like an adventure game, right down to the game doing auto jumping and climbing. The task you'll do is to clean up trash or help the family with their problems. It's a nice lighthearted game, but I can see why someone would find this type of thing boring. The sound design and graphics are pretty good, especially for the GameCube, but this is much more of a niche kind of game. I can see why it wasn't really a smash hit. Next we have Cube of War Survival of the Fittest. This game goes for about 1400 on Amazon and up to 400, 500 or even 600 on eBay. It's a very strange game. It's a survival game where you play as a cube of war, which is some kind of strange cube monster. Your goal is to become the strongest cube of war. You start out playing as this pig looking thing, but I guess it could be anything really. You go around the world fighting and eating other cubes and harnessing your skills. As you eat more creatures, you evolve and gain upgrades. That's the best I can describe it though. I can't even really tell what's going on half the time. There's also mating. Jeez, I don't know if this is appropriate for YouTube. The graphics for this game are terrible. I get it's a cube based game, but so is Minecraft and that game looks better than this. The textures are also really muddy and it honestly looks like an N64 game, which to be fair is what it's originally was supposed to be. This game does feel like it would fit in well on Steam or some type of digital storefront as an indie game with the bizarre concept and lackluster graphics, so I guess in that way maybe it's a bit ahead of its time. I feel like this game would have been better if it was like an open world game, maybe with different biomes to explore, because you just kind of walk from area to area, it feels very linear. And linear gameplay just doesn't make sense for this kind of game. The camera is by far the biggest obstacle in the game, and it's going to start pissing you off really fast. Overall this game is just kind of alright. I didn't play any of the games this video for all that long as this is just kind of a first impressions video. I guess this game is somewhat unique, but eh, I was mainly bored playing it. The next game is called Go Go Hypergrind. It was published by Atlas, the same company that published Cube of War. While this game was developed in Japan, it was only released in the US, so that's already a great sign. This game goes for about 400 on eBay at the lowest and the prices just go up from there. The art design of this game was done by Spumco, which was the animation company founded by John Creek Falusi, who is most known for making Ren and Stimpy and also grooming and sexually abusing teenage girls. This game is a cartoony skateboarding game. Why exactly they picked skateboarding as a genre is beyond me. And for whatever reason this game advertises itself as being edgy and raunchy. And yeah, I guess there is some stuff like that in the game, but it's nothing too envelope pushing. The game is only rated T after all. Games like Conker's Bad Fur Day and Leisure Suit Larry had already existed. So I don't know if anyone's really venting over this game, especially seeing how GTA Vice City only came out a year prior. So you get to the tutorial and you find out right away the biggest problem with this game is the controls. I have not played any other skateboarding games, but I feel like at least one of them has to have controls that actually listen to the buttons on the controller. Not only is the movement extremely tight, but you also have times where you press the corresponding buttons to do the action and it just doesn't do it. And to make things worse. Pause the game and read the instructions again. 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 Pause the game, 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 pause the game. Shut the fuck up! Eventually, we get to watch the cutscenes and they really look terrible. Well, I get that they probably didn't have the budget for a full-fledged TV quality animation. If you got Spumco involved, you'd think the cutscenes would have at least more than one frame in them. They're just keyframing around PNGs. That being said, the cell shaded art style and character designs are decent, even if a lot of these characters look like something from Fur Affinity. The whole point of this game is to do enough tricks to get points, and there are some cartoonish moves, like the ones where you get cut in half or blown up. However, other than that, this game just kind of feels like a regular skateboarding game. It doesn't do anything overtly unique that I can't imagine you couldn't do in the countless other skateboarding games out there. Also, the soundtrack is honestly ear grating So overall, this game sucks and you shouldn't bother with it. Finally, we have Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. This game usually hovers around the $300, $400 range and is probably the most popular game in the video. Fire Emblem is a well-known series, but it was not as well-known outside of Japan during this time, which is probably why the game is so hard to get now. This is also the most advanced Fire Emblem game for the time, being on a home console while most of the others were on handhelds. 
It was in 3D and it had full voice acting. Also, as no surprise, this is pretty obviously the best game in the group we've played today. The graphics and the cutscenes are really well done, and while the voice acting is a little rough at times, this was during a time when anime dubs were rougher in general, so it's serviceable. Fire Emblem is a tactical RPG where you need to use strategy and turn-based movement to win battles. The combat is pretty easy to pick up, but it takes time to fully master. It's still pretty fun though. This is the first Fire Emblem game I've played, so this is all mainly new to me, other than the few things I knew about the series prior, mainly from Smash Bros. Obviously I didn't play too much of this game, but I can tell you that what I did play was pretty enjoyable. $400 enjoyable? Nah, that's your call. But if you're willing to emulate or use a USB loader to play an ISO from this game, you'll get a pretty solid experience. I knew it! I knew you were playing a pirate in Nintendo games! Time to die! Oh shit!